Good morning, everyone. Say it with me. No pain. We're in week two of this series that I sincerely hope is uh, the most unnecessary series I've ever preached. Uh, but as I shared and explained last weekend, looking ahead to the fact that sometime later this year, we'll likely be handing off to a new uh, lead pastor, and I'll ride shotgun for about six months with him to learn the ropes. Uh, I don't want to have anyone look back years to come and say, Pastor Stan never told us about this. And it is the one series I told the team that if there was uh, one to check off yet that I felt like I needed to cover, it is this one. And so we're talking about no pain, no gain, how to suffer for Christ's sake. And uh, last weekend, we talked about the pain in our personal lives. Every life has some. And we did our deeper dive Wednesday night. We do it every Wednesday except for prayer, what, prayer nights at 7 in the West Auditorium. And uh, boy, the pain in the room was palpable from what we'd all been through just in our lives and sharing about that. And uh, we ended the sermon last week, illustrated with this drawing, and identified that my pain and suffering, as is yours, is the tip of the iceberg. And the iceberg is that uh, in order to understand your pain and suffering, you need to go universe-wide and consider the fact that really God, uh, the source of all good and uh, the source of eternal life, Zoe, is in constant conflict, battle against Satan, the author of sin, uh, and evil. And this conflict between good and evil, between God and Satan, has been since before the world was created, uh, when Lucifer fell, and will continue until the very end of Scripture, uh, Revelation chapter 20, when evil will be bound and banished forever. And so it only makes sense that if we are on the edge of this cosmic battle going on, uh, not why me or that evil or pain happens in our lives, but we should kind of know this is why it does. But God promises to be with us, to give us healing and grace and power to overcome. And so I want to now go from suffering in our lives to, and, and, and suffering indeed to glorify Christ in that and draw close to him in the fellowship of our sufferings. But I want to address the kind of suffering that I would safely suggest none of us have really had to endure yet. And yet, uh, it is not true for believers around the world and for centuries since Christ. And that is legitimate suffering because you are a Christian. And you might say, well, I've had some hassles in opposition and whatnot. We may have had some hassles in opposition, but I think by the time the day is over, none of us will feel like what we've gone through as a Christian compares to what others have already done. And so let's say, if you have the app, you can follow along. Uh, the first thought is that Jesus created... Uh, oh, bef before I go into that, sorry. Um, I did this on video Wednesday because I went to my nephew's wedding yesterday, so I'm just getting back in the preaching groove. Uh, there's no humor in this sermon, all right? Uh, but I like a little lightheartedness, so I decided to put one little dash at the very beginning before we do a deep dive. So I saw this. I have a truck. It kind of made me laugh this week. <laughs> right? Right? And those of you who are younger can imagine the trauma we baby boomers go through on a regular basis. When I first started to drive in the early 70s, I could buy three gallons of gas for a dollar. And so I do CPR on myself every time I'm buying gas for almost four bucks a gallon. So anyways, all right, that's our note of humor for the day. Now a deep dive. Jesus created accurate expectations about persecution. Remember the series, uh, Make a Good Decision to Make the Decision Good? Depending on where your expectations are and your experience, the bigger the gap, the more dissatisfied we are. You get married and think you're marrying Prince or Princess Charming, and you find out that they are far from that. The bigger that gap, the, the less happy we are. You get what you say is the perfect job or the perfect house or the perfect whatever, and it's not that. The bigger that gap that our expectations are from our experience, the greater dissatisfaction, the harder it is to stay motivated and to persevere. But if we have realistic expectations and it's closer to meeting our experience, then we can handle that. Jesus is giving us clear expectations as his followers. You will notice a drastic contrast between what Jesus tells his followers to expect and what we are often ta told, especially in the, the contemporary American church. And so in Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount, this is where we read beautiful verses like, Blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They'll be satisfied. Well, he says in Matthew 5, 10, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Let me just stop there. Don't be surprised when people begin to say things about you or about Christianity that you know in your heart and you know in the word are not true. And yet they say all kinds of evil falsely against you. Jesus said, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And he rightly points out that there is a long history of people of God who've been persecuted for the cause of righteousness. And so if you can already see the tide and the truth shifting, saying, well, who are you as a Christian to say that the only way to heaven is through Jesus? How narrow-minded is that? How judgmental is that? Who are you as a Christian to say that the lifestyles and biblical va the values in this book, the morality in this book is right, and those who choose not to do that are morally wrong and going to hell? So you can already see that there is a, there is a, a turning against uh, the truth of Scripture. Not near persecution yet. And then in John chapter 15, Jesus, again, setting expectations, says, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. And let me just stop and say that one of the things that troubles me is how badly Christians want to be loved by the world. We're to be set apart. 25 years ago, Christian sociologists who studied Christians began to identify a very dangerous trend that is a reality now, and that is when you study the lifestyles and priorities of Christians and non-Christians, how they spend their time, their money, their energy, their attention, their entertainment. There is a negligible difference, if anything, between the lives of Christians and non-Christians. And we are so trying to be hip and cool. Jesus never said, I'm hip and I'm cool. See, if the world, does, the world does not love Jesus or his righteousness or his word. And so he's trying to say, if they don't love me, in fact, if they hated me, don't be surprised if they hate you. Verse 20, remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, kids, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. And then... I'm going to read a verse that's not on the screen. Jesus gives an explanation for why he's saying this because this is at the Last Supper. This is their last time together. It's a dinner party, not a party at all. And you talk about taking the mood from here to here, kind of like I just did in the last two and a half minutes. There's a somberness in this room. There's a, whoa, I don't hear this very much. And Jesus said in John 16, verse 1, these things I've spoken to you so you may be kept from stumbling. I want you to have the right expectations and if you expect following me, people are always going to love you and your life is going to be wonderful and pain-free and no problems and no struggle and no suffering. I've got to tell you something. If that's what you expect, it's different from what I experienced on the planet and yet you're following me. He says, if you were of the world, I'm sorry, they will make you outcast from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he's offering service to God. These things they will do because they've not known the Father or me, but these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them and panic. No, the panic's not in there. All right? You'll remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. And he's saying here, I'm not doing a bait and switch on you guys. I mean, first of all, it's follow me. Yeah, and they drop their nets. They follow Jesus. He walks on water, turns water into wine, all that great stuff. And they're like, wow, where'd all that go? He's like, it's not, I didn't tell you that at the beginning because I knew I was with you. I had three years to be with you, but now I know my time has come. They don't even realize what that means yet, but my time has come and some amazing, horrible things are going to happen. I'm going to rise from the dead, ascend to heaven. I won't be here, so I'm trying to give you a heads up so that when you go through this, you'll be strong. So to us, Expect the demonization of Christianity. Expect, now I can say expect the continuing demonization of Christianity. 
by the media, by politicians, by celebrities, and in everyday life. As our culture more and more begins to make Christianity the problem. Now, Jesus made some prophetic predictions uh, in Luke that became reality in Acts. So let me read for you in Luke chapter 21. He says, but before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before the king, before kings and governors for my namesake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves, for I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you'll be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they'll put some of you to death. And you'll be hated by all because of my name, yet not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Now let's unpack that for a moment. Again, he talks about being delivered in the synagogues and prisons before political authorities. And he goes on a little further, and uh, he says that, uh, that you'll be betrayed by family members. And you might say, how in the world can that be? And yet now, even after 2020 and the pandemic, when we see how divisive how to handle a virus can be in families, I'm not too surprised that Jesus said that he, who, who said is a, he called himself a stumbling block. I'm not surprised that as time goes on that faith in Christ will be a, a, a stumbling block and a, play, a point of division. And he says... By your, not a hair of your head will perish, but he's talking about them being martyred here. But Jesus is talking in an eternal perspective. We should have an eternal perspective because when I die, breathe my last breath here, I breathe my next breath with him. Amen. And so, not a hair of your head will perish in that sense. By your endurance, you'll gain your lives. Say endurance. endurance. Tell your neighbor endurance. endurance. He didn't say by, by your convenience. And so I'm going to ask you just to do your own self-inventory with the Holy Spirit. How much of your Christianity is convenience-based? When you saw we have different times for every Easter service, now it's not going to work out. Like, is that inconvenient? Convenience is one of our key values in American culture but it really doesn't last long when it comes to the cause of Christ. When you look at the New Testament church, they did not serve Christ out of convenience. They served him out of passion and out of devotion. Let me read for you just a couple of verses out of Acts 2 that aren't on the screen. Verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Day by day, say day by day. They were continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. If you are a Christian whose faith and whose practice and whose part of the body of Christ is out of convenience, eh, we're not going to go this week and we'll sleep in next week and we're going to go on the third week so we'll be there once this month. If it's all a matter of convenience, you're in trouble, my friend. Because as it gets steeper, you're all of a sudden going to find endurance that you didn't have. And the third point says, all but the Apostle John. Those words that Jesus, oh, I'm sorry, let me back up. Um, I said they were prophetic predictions. Now, Jesus was talking about being betrayed and being arrested and even losing your life. So let's fast forward just to the disciples because we have a tendency to read what he said 2,000 years ago and apply it right away here. No, that applied in the first century. In Acts chapter 4, verse 1, Peter and John are there, they're ministering. And it says in verse 1, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them. Okay, these are temple officials, just like Jesus said, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many, so, so, what Jesus said, boom. Man, Peter had to have a flashback to Christ saying that. We're being, they're laying their hands on us, and they're arresting us. And then when they stood before them, they give their defense. And Jesus said, don't worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will give you the words. It'll be, a, it'll be a testimony. Bang. Verse 4, many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Suffering has been a tremendous tool for the spread of the gospel. 
in the New Testament and beyond. Let's jump to Acts chapter 7. Instead, we have now Stephen. And they were telling lies about Stephen. Acts chapter 7, verse 1. The high priest, there again, you have a temple official, said, are these things so? And then go read Acts chapter 7. Stephen gives the most phenomenal sermon from the Old Testament to the New and to Jesus Christ and who he is. And they killed him, put him to death, but he died for the sins of mankind. And verse 54, end of that chapter, it says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick because he's pointing the finger at them. They began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, covered their ears, and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Pause button. Jesus said they'll think they're doing God a favor by the persecution. And Saul would be the man who would eventually become Paul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. He died. Man, he died like Jesus. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he breathed his last. A martyr for the cause of Christ, just like Jesus said. Fast forward even further to Acts chapter 12. And in Acts chapter 12, it says, Now about that time, Herod the king, Jesus said, kings, governors, officials, laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, one of the disciples, put to death with a sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews... He proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. It became crowd-pleasing to persecute Christians. And how much is it going to become crowd-pleasing to bash Christians? Do you think it's going to be politically correct to be pro-Christian, pro-Scripture? For much? It's not even politically correct now. You can sense the tide shifting. And the third point says, all but the Apostle John. In John chapter 1, or Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, this is the best friend of Jesus. In Revelation 1, 9, he says, I, John, your brother, and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus. Isn't that interesting? I would imagine if you picked the top three most popular words in modern American Christian messages, podcasts, songs, whatevers, you probably wouldn't have tribulation, kingdom, and perseverance. But it's near the end of the first century, 90-something A.D., which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. What's that about? I'm here. I've been sent to this island in exile. Because, of Jesus, because I testified of Christ. And so they've sent me here alone to live the rest of my days, to die in exile. And in that horrible place, God met him and he had this incredible revelation. It's the last book of Scripture. But he is the only follower that Jesus called among his 12 that died anything like a natural death. Let me share for you a, a, a grim reminder Peter was crucified upside down. They were going to crucify him. He didn't feel worthy to be crucified like Christ was. So they literally flipped him upside down and crucified him. Paul was beheaded, both of them around A.D. 66, which is under the persecution of Nero, the Roman emperor. Again, tradition tells us that Andrew, Peter's brother, after, I'll tell you where they ministered and then how they died. Uh, what's now the Soviet, uh, Russia and then Turkey and Greece, Peter was, or Andrew was crucified. Imagine two brothers. That mom lost two brothers to crucifixion because of following Jesus. What would that do to a family? Thomas, after ministering in Syria and India, was killed with spears. The disciple Philip, after being in North Africa, Asia Minor, and uh, Turkey, was crucified after leading the proconsuls, one of the government officials' wives, to Christ. Matthew, ministering in Persia and Ethiopia, was stabbed to death in Ethiopia. Bartholomew, ministering in India, Armenia, Ethiopia, Southern Arabia, was beheaded. 
James, the son of Alphaeus, ministering in Syria, was stoned and clubbed to death. Simon the Zealot, ministering in, from Africa to a, in India, refused to sacrifice to the sun god, was sawn in two. Matthias, ministering in Syria, was burned to death. Only John died a somewhat natural cause death on the island of Patmos. The words of Jesus were prophetic as Luke recorded them, and they came true in the decades that would follow from 33 AD when Christ was crucified until the early 90s, uh, the last disciple being John. As an American Christian, if you can't obey Jesus and you can't obey this word now, we Americans are really good at saying, I know the Bible says this, but, I know it says this, but, I know it says this, but, if we can't serve him in, for the most part, comfort and convenience, I don't think we're going to have more determination when the heat is on. And uh, I would love to say that it just stayed with the disciples' first century. Persecution and martyrdom didn't stay in the first century. Let's fast forward and let me read for you from a book written by a pastor, a Romanian pastor, Richard Wormbrand. He became the founder of an organization called The Voice of the Martyrs. Months of solitary confinement, years of periodic physical torture, constant suffering from hunger and cold, the anguish of brainwashing and mental cruelty, these are the experiences of a Romanian pastor during his 14 years in communist prisons. His crime, like that of thousands of others, was his fervent belief in Jesus Christ and his public witness concerning that faith. Meeting in homes, in basements, and in woods, sometimes daring to preach in public on street corners, these faithful souls persisted in their Christian witness, knowing full well the ultimate cost of their actions. This is their story, a classic account of courage, tenacious faith, and unbelievable endurance. The history of the underground church reflects the continuing struggle in many parts of the world today. And I'm going to read far more than I would normally read in a sermon, but I think it's very relevant to the subject. And this is stuff that we as Christians in America are rarely aware of. Studies show that there are more Christians have been martyred in the last century than all previous centuries combined. And so Richard Wormbrand writes this. His suffering was primarily uh, late 1930s through the 1940s. Uh, when there was still the Soviet Socialist Republic, uh, the old Soviet Union. And he's in Romania, a communist country. He said, I worked in both an official and un underground manner until February 29th, 1948. On that beautiful Sunday, on my way to church, I was kidnapped from the street by the secret police. I had often wondered what was meant by man-stealing, which is mentioned several times in the Bible. Communism has taught us. Many at that time were kidnapped like this. A van of the secret police stopped in front of me. Two men jumped out and pushed me into the vehicle. I was taken to a prison where I was kept secretly for over eight years. During that time, no one knew whether I was dead or alive. My wife was visited by the secret police who posed as fellow released prisoners. They told her that they had attended my burial, and she was heartbroken. Thousands of believers from churches of all denominations went to prison at that time. Not only were clergymen put in jail, but also simple peasants, young boys and girls who witnessed for their faith. The prisons were full. And in Romania, as in all communist countries, to be in prison means to be tortured. The tortures were sometimes horrible. I prefer not to speak too much about those, though, which I, which I have passed, through which I have passed. It's too painful. When I do, I can't sleep at night. A pastor by the name of Florescu was tortured with red-hot iron pokers and with knives. He was badly, beaten very badly. Then starving rats were driven into his cell through a large pipe. He could not sleep because he had to defend himself all the time. If he rested a moment, the rats would attack him. He was forced to stand for two, two weeks, day and night. The communists wished to compel him to betray his brethren, but he resisted steadfastly. Eventually, they brought his 14-year-old son to the prison and began to whip the boy in front of his father saying that they would continue to beat him until the pastor said what they wished him to say. The poor man was half mad. He bored as long as he could. Then he cried to his son, Alexander, I must say what they want. I can't bear your beating anymore. The son answered, Father, don't do me the injustice of having a traitor as a parent. Withstand. If they kill me, I will die with the words, Jesus and my fatherland. The communist, enraged, fell upon the child and beat him to death with blood spattered over the walls of the cell. He died praising God, 
but our dear brother Floresca was never the same after seeing this. Handcuffs with sharp nails on the insides were placed on our wrists. If we were totally still, they didn't cut us. But in bitterly cold cells, when we shook with cold, our wrists would be torn by the nails. Christians were hung upside down on ropes and beaten so severely that their bodies swung back and forth under the blows. Christians were also placed in icebox refrigerator cells, which were so cold that frost and ice covered the inside. I was thrown into one while I had very little clothing on. Prison doctors would watch through an opening until they saw symptoms of freezing to death. Then they would give a signal. The guards would rush in, take us out, make us warm. When we were finally warmed, we would immediately be put back into the icebox cells to freeze. Thawing out, then freezing to within minutes of death, being thawed out over and over again. Even today, there are times I can't bear to open a refrigerator. We Christians were sometimes forced to stand in wooden boxes only slightly larger than we were. This left no room to move. Dozens of sharp nails were driven into every side of the box with their razor-sharp points sticking through the wood. While we stood perfectly still, it was all right. But we were forced to stand in those boxes for endless hours. When we became fatigued and swayed with tiredness, the nails would pierce our bodies. If we moved or twitched a muscle, there were the horrible nails. What the communists have done to Christians surpasses any possibility of human understanding. I've seen communists whose faces while torturing believers shone with rapturous joy. They cried out while torturing the Christians, we are the devil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers of evil. We saw that communism is not from men, but from the devil. It's a spiritual force, a force of evil, and can only be countered by a greater spiritual force, the Spirit of God. I often ask the torturers, don't you have pity in your hearts? They usually answer with quotations from Lenin. You cannot make omelets without breaking the shells of eggs. You cannot cut wood without making chips fly. I would say, I know those quotations from Lenin, but there is a difference. When you cut a piece of wood, it feels nothing. But here you're dealing with human beings. Every beating produces pain, and there are mothers who weep. It was in vain. They are materialists. For them, nothing besides matter exists. And to them, a man is like wood, like an eggshell. With this belief, they sank to unthinkable depths of cruelty. The cruelty of atheism is hard to believe, but when a person has no faith in reward of good or the punishment of evil, there's no reason to be human. There is no restraint from the depths of evil that is in man. The communist torturers often said, there is no God, no hereafter, no punishment for evil. We can do what we wish. I heard one torturer say, I thank God in whom I don't believe that I've lived to this hour when I can express all the evil in my heart. And he expressed it in unbelievable brutality and torture inflicted on prisoners. I have testified before the Internal Security Subcommittee of the United States Senate. There I described awful things, such as Christians tied to crosses for four days and nights. The crosses were placed on the floor, and hundreds of prisoners had to fulfill their bodily necessities over the faces and bodies of the crucified ones. Then the crosses were erected again, and the communists jeered and mocked. Look at your Christ, how beautiful he is, what fragrance he brings from heaven. I described how after being driven nearly insane with tortures, a priest was forced to consecrate human excrement and urine and give holy communion to Christians in this form. One of our workers in the underground church was a young girl. The communist police discovered that she secretly spread gospels and taught children about Christ. They decided to arrest her, but to make the arrest as agonizing and painful as they could, they delayed to her, her arrest a few weeks until the day she was to be married. On her wedding day, the girl was dressed as a bride, the most wonderful, joyous day in a girl's life. Suddenly, the door burst open and the secret police rushed in. When the bride saw the secret police, she held out her arms toward them to be handcuffed. They roughly put the manacles on her wrists. She looked toward her beloved, then kissed the chains and said, I thank my heavenly bridegroom for this jewel he's presented to me on my marriage day. I thank him that I'm worthy to suffer for him. She was dragged off with weeping Christians and a weeping bridegroom left behind. They knew what happens to young Christian girls in the hands of communist guards. Her bridegroom faithfully waited for her. After five years, she was released, a destroyed, broken woman looking 30 years older. She said it was the least she could do for her Christ. Such beautiful Christians are in the underground church. If you don't like to hear that, I assure you, I don't like reading it. But not reading it, not attending to it, doesn't make it untrue. It doesn't remove it from history. What's worse, it doesn't make it stop happening at this moment in other places across the world. You say, well, that's the 1940s, 1950s, whatever. Let's fast forward to the 1980s. And uh, a, a journalist interviewed a man named Alexander 
They met in Moscow. As he peering at me over his granny reading glasses, he said, thank you for caring, his voice choking with emotion. This Russian dissident wearing a dark pinstripe suit sporting a ponytail had spent seven lonely years in the former Soviet prison system, or Gulag. He'd been convicted of running a Christian discussion group for other students at the Moscow State University where he was studying filmmaking. Did you hear that? It was illegal to run a Christian Bible study at a university. Those restrictions are already encroaching on our state universities. You have to get a special permit. You have to have the, the right place. You can't just share your faith in public. S many state universities are beginning that oppression. I first learned of his plight from a letter he had written to former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. The letter was published by Keston College, a British-based organization that monitored persecution in the former Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. In the letter, he told Gorbachev that he'd been in prison for five years and had not received one letter or visit from any Christian. Have me executed, he wrote. I know it's a sin to commit suicide, but I'm so lonely that I wish to ask you to have me executed by a firing squad. Some of those got the attention of then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, and uh, it ended up resulting in a huge groundswell that brought his release. Now he's running a soup kitchen for homeless people in Moscow, and he said, you don't know what it was like to discover that there were Christians who cared, who wanted me to live, and who loved me. And let me refer you to uh, Voice of the Martyrs uh, website, and you can read story upon story of people who are paying that price and suffering now in this world, in other parts of the world. My hope, as I said, is that this is the most unnecessary sermon series I've preached in 32 years. And that's not to understate the suffering and struggle many of you have endured in life, not for the cause of Christ as a Christian, but just the pain on this planet. For some, it's, it's agonizing. But should this battle that has been raging since before the Garden of Eden make its way to our nation. As it is now in Ethiopia, Christians are being slaughtered. Parts of the Middle East, what I read in that book, are commonplace. I was glad when the Olympics happened and they mentioned the persecution of the Muslim population there, but nothing was said of persecution of Christians that's gone on for decades. And the underground church is trying to survive in spite of the imprisonments and kind of tortures that I read there. But I said last week, Romans 8, 28, God causes all things to work together for good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And I said, I add to that eventually, if we let him. You heard him say that God said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts. And the first seven chapters of the book of Acts, they were in Jerusalem, 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 Jerusalem. What ignited the gospel across the world was the persecution that scattered the church. If persecution comes our way, then words like 1 Peter chapter 4 will take on new importance to us. Beloved, this written by a man who shortly after writing this would be crucified upside down for his faith in Christ. Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. And if a fiery ordeal erupts among us, don't be surprised. It comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you revile for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or evildoer or troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he's not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. That verse is relevant, as I said right now, on the continent of Africa, across the Middle East, in parts of Asia. And it may become very relevant in North America, 
If it does, there is a perseverance and a strength that God will give you. And there, then, more than ever, it's important to remember that our existence is not just from when I was born in 1956 in Cleveland, Ohio, and when I die, wherever and whenever that is. But my existence goes beyond that because somewhere back here in my early years, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I have eternal life. And so when this earthly life ends, however it ends, and I would love for my life to end, breathing my last breath in my sleep and waking up in heaven, but who knows how it may end. When it ends here, that my greatest life has yet to begin. And when I remind myself of that, then I can step up. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, I love reading Hebrews 11. We celebrate this hall of faith of great, great heroes of faith. We talk about how Abraham had faith and Noah and Moses and David and Rahab and all, Sarah, all, Ab- all these people, how they had their faith and the, right, the righteousness to live by faith. And then the next chapter says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, all the Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, all your loved ones who died for serving the Lord and went to heaven, let us also lay aside every encumbrance, every distraction, and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with, say the word. Say it again. Say it again. When your faith gets hard and you don't know if you can take the next step, if that day ever comes, run it with endurance. And again and again and again, we have a history of thousands of people who have gone before us and they sing onward Christian soldiers and they mean it. And if we have to live for our faith and die for our faith, run with endurance the race that's set before you. If anyone told you the race is a cakewalk, they lied. There's no historical background for that or biblical truth. Run with endurance the race set before you. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. What joy, the joy that someday when my earthly life is over, Jesus said, I'll be with the Father and you'll be there with me. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who has endured such hostility. Again, I pray it never has, but if someday you are facing that kind of hostility and and you remember this sermon, there's a reminder, consider him, consider Jesus. He endured hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And then as if encouraging to his New Testament audience, the author of Hebrews says, you've not yet resisted the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. They'd had their property confiscated. Imagine somebody saying, you're a Christian, get out of your house, it's ours. Oh, by the way, your bank account, it's been cleared. Imagine that. That's what happened to them, the equivalent. You haven't shed blood yet, come on. Buck up, guys, you can do this. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Went all the way to the cross for us. And so how do you end this message? Next weekend, I'm going to look at what I believe are signs of the time. I pray that the gathering storm clouds on the horizon of culture are going to come and pass, but they may be the beginning of end times and ushering in the return of Christ. And so I want to give you things that I am reading as signs of the times to say that this series may not be unnecessary. But we thought, you know, let's, let's look for encouragement in Jesus. And in Matthew 26, we thought we would go ahead and go to a a time of communion. And so if you have the elements that you received when you came in, if you'll prepare to to take those. If not, if you'll raise your hand, your section leader will bring them to you. There's some down here. Anyone else need them? Over here. Over here, there's a few section leaders throughout. Down here, down here, over here. Just keep your hand up and wave it a little bit. They can see you. We take communion today thinking what if those dreadful things happen when Jesus shared it with his disciples he knew it was about to happen it makes the last supper that more that much more incredible knowing it was about to happen what did he say to his disciples guys let not your heart be troubled you believe in the father believe also in me Whatever's going on this earth, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you may be also. 
And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself. Don't let your heart be troubled. Knowing what he knew, that hours from that statement, all hell was going to break loose. And he was going to live the epitome of what he prophesied, that governors were going to come against him. Synagogue officials were going to lie against him and come with false witnesses. And they were going to trump up charges against him. And he would be tortured to death, beaten, spit upon, disrespected, hung naked on a cross till he died. And he is the one who holds what he said, this represents my blood. They didn't know what he was talking about. This represents my broken body, my shredded body. Don't let your heart be troubled. Man, if this world is the end of it, it's a horribly troubled heart. But this world is not my home and I am just passing through. I'm only visiting this planet and I'm here with a mission just like you are to represent Jesus to a fallen world. And so in Matthew 26, verse 26, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread. And after a blessing, he broke it and he gave to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Other, other scriptures say where he said, this is broken for you. This is ripped to pieces for you guys. But I'm going the distance. So you can go the distance. And when he'd taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. And I'm sure they're at the Passover. They're thinking symbolic as we are now. It's symbolic. He's saying, this is about to be literal. I say to you, I'm not, and here's the hope. I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And, they, and I'm sure in the days that would come and all the horrors that would unfold, and then when they would see Christ after he rose from the dead, and when they would take communion together, not with Jesus, but together, somebody had to say, guys, Jesus said we should do the bread and the cup. Let's do it and remember him. And all of a sudden, they would remember what he said. Someday I'll take this new with you in my Father's kingdom. And years later, when John would write about the marriage supper of the Lamb, they would be able to toast and say, we were there at the Last Supper, and we'll be there at the marriage supper of the Lamb, at that wedding reception. We celebrate Jesus Christ. He saved us from our sins. He gave us the hope of eternity. And we prevailed and persevered through everything life had to dish out. And if you endure persecution, we endure persecution because we knew that this earth is not our home. And I will never, ever, ever forget, friend, never, ever, ever forget till the day you die that Jesus did this for you. Because if you remember this, remember me, remember me, remember me. If you remember what he did for you, he makes all the difference in the world in your world. The blessings are sweeter. I love blessings, comfort, and convenience. Don't get me wrong. But the blessings are sweeter. And in the hardships, I'm not alone. And in, in the agony, somehow I have strength. So would you bow your head with me? From your heart to God, thank Him. Thank Him for the bread and the cup as He did. Thank him for willing to let his body be shredded for you and me. He was willing to shed his blood for our forgiveness, for our healing, for our hope. Jesus, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. Thank you for what you did. Thank you for the men and women who've gone before us who were so passionate and the, the light of their lives and their testimony burns brightly to us through the centuries of time, even today. Thank you, God, for every blessing, every sunny day, every smile, every comfort we've enjoyed. Forgive us for taking those for granted or allowing those to be distractions. But we thank you, God, that there is a fellowship of your sufferings. And in those moments of pain, whether it be physical, emotional, relational, whatever, 
we sense your comfort. In those times of hardship, in those times of loneliness, you're present with us. You never leave us or forsake us. And so with great hearts of gratitude, we take this bread that represents your body. We drink this cup reminding us of your blood and we remember you. Let's take the bread and the cup together. Would you stand with us as we close and let's make this song the cry of our heart. Center of it all. At the center of it all. 